Welcome back to Judgment Decision Making. My name is Dr. Padilla. Now we're going to talk about availability, emotion, and risk. Let's start by thinking about two specific types of heuristics. First, we're going to talk about the availability heuristic that we've discussed quite a bit throughout this lecture series. It is the heuristic where rather than thinking about the value of something, we substitute that judgment for how easy it is to remember. Things that are easier to remember, we like them more, we trust them more, we think they're more reliable. Or we're substituting a judgment of value for a judgment of just how easy it is to think of something. So for example, the Kardashians are pretty easy to remember because they're always in front of the media, which is a really strong strategy for how to make you seem more valuable and relevant to society. The next one is the affect heuristic. This is where we substitute our emotional response to information for an evaluation of risk. In this case, the Twin Tower bombings are a very emotional topic. And when you're thinking about things like a terrorist attack, instead of thinking about the actual probability of a terrorist attack, which is very small in relationship to general probabilities, rather than thinking about a probabilistic number, you evoke the feeling that you would get from remembering a terrorist attack. So you think about the Twin Towers bombing or the Capitol insurrection, and you have an emotional response to that. And so you think that the likelihood of a terrorist attack is actually higher because you're evaluating the, the level of your emotional response to that information. Now let's think about how these two combine and note that most heuristics do work together. It's fairly rare you have a single heuristic functioning at, at any given time. Okay, so I want you to think about the relative difference in the likelihood of someone dying of a stroke versus accidental deaths. So decide which you think is more probable that someone dies of a stroke or an accidental death. I'm going to roll footage of me doing this in class so you can see if you have the same type of judgment as students in a classroom. So I'm going to show you a sequence of different types of ways to die. And I would like you to decide which do you think is more likely. So in this case, do you think it is more likely that people will die of strokes? Or do you think it's more likely that people will die from accidental deaths? Okay. All right. Were you the same? Were you different? What we find is that strokes cause twice as many deaths than accidents, all accidents combined. And 80% of participants think that accidental deaths are more likely, which is what the students in the classroom also believed. You know, why is this happening? It's really because accidents are always on the news. You know, when there's an extreme car crash or some crazy unexpected accident that causes death, it tends to be reported, but strokes tend to not be reported on the news. So they are easy to remember accidental deaths compared to strokes. And then these accidental deaths can be scarier. The types of ways that people die in accidents can be fairly gruesome. So this is two types of heuristics coming together to make a double whammy that really influences your judgments and make you, makes you think that they're more likely to occur. Let's do another one, tornadoes versus asthma. Now, when I do this in class, the students know the trick at this point. So um, while most uh, participants would actually say tornadoes, um, the students in the class tend to say asthma, and you probably thought asthma as well. Asthma is 20 times um, more likely to occur than uh, deaths by tornadoes, even though people think that tornadoes um, are more frequent killers. Lightning versus botulism. Lightning is 52 times more frequent than botulism, even though people judge them as about the same likelihood. Disease versus accidental deaths. Disease is 18 times more likely than accidental deaths, even though the two were judged about equal. And accidents versus diabetes. Um, accidental death is about 300 times more likely than diabetes, 
or accidental deaths were judged to be 300 times more likely than diabetes, but the true ratio is one to four. So all of this is to say that we have a tendency to think of these very emotional events that are very easy to remember as more likely or we increase the likelihood more than, than it actually should be in our mind. And this brings us to, you know, what do we do about this? We know from this lecture series that our judgments are really based on heuristics that can lead to ineffective judgments. So how do we find a more quantitative, a more objective way to evaluate risk? So let's think about this in a context of a real problem, which is, should we have self-driving cars? So I want you to think about in your mind, <clears throat> should we have self-driving cars? Um, what do you think? What's your, your case <laughs> for self-driving cars or not? I'm going to show you a video that shows you some of the cons of self-driving cars. Okay, so you have these two guys playing patty cake while passing a semi in the snow. These two individuals are playing a game while in heavy traffic, sleeping, dancing, cards, etc. Right. So when I see this, I get kind of emotional. I get sort of angry that these people are doing this. They're endangering, potentially endangering themselves and others. So I have a strong emotional response when I see this. And it might lead me to think that self-driving cars are more risky than they are. But let's watch another video. And I want you to think about how your emotions might change while watching this video. The world of transportation and mobility is being turned upside down. So the question now is, as we go forward, can we direct this towards a better future? It's hard to imagine a technology with greater capacity to change the world than autonomous cars. In addition to saving lives, it could have massive environmental benefits by reducing congestion and increasing efficiency. And we have overall a city with much less land devoted to roads, much less land devoted to parking, and we use those lands in a way that people will enjoy, whether it's park space or playgrounds. It will mean that we have better transportation, more equitable access. Right, so that was a lot of pros to self-driving cars. Maybe that made you feel a little bit less emotional, maybe more interested in adopting self-driving car technology. And I wanna point out that both of these videos proposed different metrics for evaluating the risk. The first one showed all of these instances where people were acting um, crazy while in self-driving cars, or at least reckless. In the second video, we saw many different quantifiable examples of the positives of self-driving cars. So this begs the question, how do we actually quantify this risk? You know, one way to do this is to think about lives lost due to crashes. If we focus just on self-driving cars, this is a very tricky question um, where it is unclear who is at fault if individuals die from an accident in a self-driving car. Is it the car manufacturer's fault? Is it the individual behind the wheel? That is very tricky. So we could quantify lives lost due to self-driving cars and use that as our risk est estimate. We'll say, maybe there's just too many deaths from self-driving cars, they can't be allowed. Or maybe there's some reasonable amount, I don't know what that amount is, but maybe there's some reasonable amount of uh, mortality associated with this technology. Don't come after me for, for framing it like that. But that's the reality of the types of judgments that people have to make. You know, at, at how many deaths are acceptable to get this technology on the road, given all of those benefits you saw in the prior video. That's a real judgment people are making. But you could quantify it differently. You could think about, well, let's focus on lives saved due to the lack of crashes. Yes, maybe a small portion of people die due to self-driving cars, but maybe they save thousands, if not millions of lives, because they reduce the driver error, which is one of the key contributors to fatalities on the road. 
So you can see if you frame it differently, the actual ratio becomes different. And which one you care about is dependent on things that uh, feel emotional to, to you. If you're someone who distrusts technology, you're going to value or weight the lives lost due to self-driving car incidences. If you're someone who isn't as um, suspicious of technology and you have less of an emotional response to that type of technology in the world, you'll probably value lives saved due to lack of crashes. And then the other one to think about is um, lives saved due to reducing climate change. Again, there's emotional uh, responses that are evoked by thinking about climate change. And so if you're someone that has a strong emotional response to climate change, you might value that metric as what we should use for considering the risk of self-driving cars. In particular, if you're a young person and you have to live with this climate for 80 years, you know, you might value that more than the others. So that's to say that these risk judgments are still subjective. Even the quantifiable ones are subjective based on how much weight we apply to them. There's many ways to evaluate risk. I've just shown you three here, but there's many more. And policymakers and car manufacturers have the same biases as we do. They are not some special group of people so the individuals that are making the decisions about if this technology is appropriate for the road are just as biased as we are and will value different metrics in different ways like the rest of us. Your judgments about risk will be based on your emotional reaction, which is the affect heuristic, and on the availability of the argument. So that was the other part of this is I showed you two videos and I made each kind of proposition of pros and cons available in your mind. So if you're never told the benefits of self-driving cars, it's not available in your mind and you, you're not going to be influenced by that information. So it really matters how much the pros and cons are advertised and communicated to the public because that will influence the risk judgments. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about that's related to this is the availability cascade. It's really what I was just mentioning with how information is, is put out on the media. This is the self-sustaining chain of events, which may start from a media report that is relatively a minor event and lead up to a public panic and a large-scale government action. What can happen is if the media picks up on something they can make people have a larger emotional response by reporting on it more and more and more, which creates a snowball. One example of this was this Love Canal situation where toxic waste was being exposed during a raining season, <laughs> excuse me, in 1971. And it caused smell and it was pretty foul situation. And this one woman, Lois Gibbs, kind of picked up on it. And the reason that this was really a cascade was because she was so good at capturing the attention of the media. At the time, she was you know, considered a very beautiful woman and she would go on news um, stations and really talk about the horrors of the situation. And they had all these campaigns where they would, you know, put out children and in protest and take pictures and they even had a documentary made. So all of this is to say that they created a cascade where the more people reported on it, the more people reported on it. And this was a relatively small event, but it led to massive changes uh, in terms of policy and investment on this particular problem. Now, if we think in contrast to something that is a very large problem that has received less attention, this would be the Flint, Michigan um, water crisis. Very, very similar, except for Flint, Michigan, it is way more extensive, has been happening for much longer, not one rainy season. And the main thing I want to point out is the GDP per capita in Flint, Michigan is $29,000. And the GDP for the, where this Love Canal event was, which is near Niagara Falls, was $44,000. So a big part of this is the Love Canal event got so much press in part because it was in a very affluent place 
where people were constantly um, checking up and reporting in kind of a secular event. And it wasn't until fairly recently that people were even interested in Flint, Michigan, because it was an area that wasn't as interesting to the media. And they're still having issues today getting clean drinking water in that location. Okay, summary here. Uh, most heuristics do work together. Risk is very subjective. I hope you saw many examples of that during this video. And then the availability cascade is a self-sustaining chain of events, which may start from a media report of a relatively minor event and lead up to public panic and large-scale government action.